Indeed. Well, please take out your Bibles and turn with me in the New Testament to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. The Gospel of John, chapter 19, we will be looking this morning at verses 8 through the beginning of verse 12. As we continue to see Christ standing before Pilate, the Roman procurator, the governor, who will render judgment in his case, we see now Pilate's response to this announcement that the Jews made in verse 7 last week, where they burst out the truth that so offends them, and that being that this Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. We saw in our last lesson the Jewish leader's frustration over Pilate's reluctance to condemn Jesus. And so there is this moment of exasperated honesty. Here is the real reason for their hatred. We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. This is what so offended them, but they could not say that to the Romans up until now. They knew that that would not be a crime that would get any traction before the Roman authorities. What they did not anticipate, perhaps, is the way in which that claim would strike Pilate. And they perhaps do not know how close they came to having the case thrown out right then and there. The Jewish leaders were determined to see Jesus killed, but they needed the cooperation of the Roman authorities in order to accomplish that goal. But ironically, the aspect of Jesus' teaching that most offended them and drove their hatred and violence proved to be the aspect that almost undid their plan. For a Jew to claim to be the Son of God was considered unforgivable blasphemy. But a claim like that would be very different or viewed very differently by superstitious Roman pagans. If Jesus had come to a Greek or a Roman community, if he was born to a virgin in Athens or in Rome, then his original audience would have readily believed that he was a son of the gods. Now that doesn't mean they would have understood the incarnation properly. No, they they would not have understood what we know the Bible to teach about Christ becoming a man. But nonetheless, they had a concept of a divine man. They had a concept of gods appearing in the form of men, and they had even a category of demigods in which God, uh, a god, would interact in a sexual way with a a human being, and the result would be a semi-divine offspring. The point is that the Greeks and the Romans would not have been offended by the claim that Jesus might belong among the gods, but the Jews found that idea absolutely intolerable. And so we wonder, why then does Jesus come to the Jewish people and not to the Greeks, not to the Romans? Obviously, he didn't choose the easiest path, but that brings us to the very point today that we want to make, and that is that everything about the incarnation, everything about Christ's work of atonement, every aspect of redemption was ordered by the sovereign providence of God. Jesus did not make a strategic mistake by being born in Israel. It was that way by God's divine appointment. And so he stands here before Pilate for judgment by the same decree. Notice in verses 8 and 9 that Pilate, when he hears this saying by the Jews, this claim to divinity that Jesus has made, Pilate is struck with fear. In fact, the text says literally he was more afraid. The Jews were angry and offended, but Pilate was afraid Now, we have no reason to think that Pilate was a devoutly religious man, but he was a Roman, and so undoubtedly he had certain superstitious ideas about the gods and the way in which they interacted with men. And so he wonders, perhaps, what if Jesus was, in fact, a divine man? What if he was one of the gods disguised in human form or or somehow was connected to them? What if he is a son of one of the gods? And now the divine parent will bring wrath against the Roman judge. Remember that Pilate has just ordered Jesus to be scourged. He has allowed his soldiers to beat him and abuse him, knowing all the time that he is innocent, intending by that abuse perhaps to win sympathy from the crowd so that he can allow Jesus to be set free. But if he is a son of the gods, what kind of consequence is going to come for Pilate for those decisions and actions? 
You may remember the warning that Pilate's wife gave him earlier in that same day. It's not recorded in the Gospel of John, but we read it in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27. When Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. And you could just imagine as Pilate is struck with fear, that warning from earlier in the morning is echoing in his mind perhaps. What has he done? Even if in ignorance, even if in all sincerity, what has he done? He is more afraid. Unfortunately, many people today do not show the same reverence for God and the things of God as even this pagan reprobate did. Pilate has more respect for the fictitious gods of the Roman pantheon than many people today have for the true and the living God. Do we consider the majesty of the God before whom we live? Do we live with such a a keen awareness of the presence of the true God that an encounter like this would strike us with fear as well? We need to have a hearty, wholesome fear. Not the terror of judgment that may have gripped Pilate if only for a moment, but a, a hearty, wholesome fear which leads us to treat the name of God and His honor with great reverence. But you see, it doesn't last long. Verse 10, when he comes and asks Jesus, where are you from? And Jesus does not reply. Pilate now is the one who is offended. Not by a a claim to divinity, but by Jesus, this common Jew, a person of no importance, ignoring the great and illustrious Pontius Pilate. His fear becomes personal offense and anger. Because Pilate, after all, deserves respect. He is the Roman governor. He is a citizen of the empire. And Jesus is nothing and nobody. Now this dramatic shift in the text needs to remind us that even the fear that an unregenerate person feels about the majesty of God will be ultimately short-lived. We should not imagine reprobates condemned in hell as always being in a state of terror gripped by the judgment of God because we see in the book of Revelation that while, while at the beginning of judgment they cry to the mountains and the hills, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb, Shortly thereafter, their fear turns to anger. They gnash their teeth. They shake an angry fist at the heavens. They blaspheme God because of their pain. The fear of God that the reprobate feels does not last, and it does not prompt any true change in their character or in their heart. But pay attention here to the irony of what Pilate says. He confesses that Jesus is an innocent man, and then he turns around, and when he is personally offended by Jesus, he threatens to crucify him. (laughs) You're not speaking to me? Don't you know that I have power to execute you? Last week, we said that Pilate is not a virtuous person. He is not concerned about justice. He is a political pragmatist. And while he doesn't want to be bothered by a religious feud among the Jews, he is certainly not above using his power to crush and kill a man that he knows has done nothing wrong. It's as if Pilate is saying to him, pay attention to me. Show me respect. I am a powerful person. I am very important. (laughs) And those kind of threats only make Pilate appear to be the weak person that he is. Who is he trying to convince? It's a reminder of the way that our own egos may work sometime. Does our ego look like Pilate's? Do we need others to validate us and confirm our own sense of self-importance? Would we be offended if someone ignores us? We need to convince them of, of how worthy of respect we are? Human beings have been proud and insecure since the fall, but I am convinced that the latter part of the 20th and the first part of the 21st century, this particular trait has gotten worse, and I blame social media. Have we ever seen a more narcissistic society than late Western modernity. How much of our public conduct and comments are nothing more than just virtue signaling to our neighbors to assure everyone around us, we get it, we're one of the good guys. And by the way, you see that as much in the church as anywhere outside of it. It's a game that is played. And we need to be aware of that. Because we may be guilty more often of letting our egos get the better of us in that way than we realize. But Jesus does finally reply to Pilate in verse 11. He doesn't answer the original question. He doesn't answer the question, where are you from? But he does respond to the self-aggrandizing threat that Pilate made. He says, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. 
Pilate thinks that he is powerful. He's only a player in a much larger game, a piece on the board, a pawn. And Jesus says, another hand has moved you into position. He only has a role to play insofar as he is used by that greater authority. And when his role is finished, then that hand will remove him from the board. There can be no doubt about what power Jesus has in mind. The authority above Pilate is not the Roman emperor. It's not the Jewish chief priest. It's not even the devil himself. The authority that gave Pilate power to sit in judgment of the Son of God is God himself. Jesus is acknowledging that his circumstances are not the result of chance. That they are not ultimately the result of Judas's betrayal or a Jewish plot or any human or demonic cause. Now, all of those were factors in what happened, certainly. All of them are secondary causes. But the fact is, God was the ultimate cause behind it all. And God's involvement in these proceedings does not negate the moral responsibility of these secondary agents as the rest of verse 11 proves. But Jesus wants Pilate to know this is not a situation that you have power over. This is not an unfortunate or unforeseen or unavoidable circumstance. It is the outworking of the divine purpose. It is a consequence of the will of God. Now the various actors in the drama still retained moral responsibility for their actions. They were not robots. Even though we called Pilate a a pawn a moment ago, we don't mean that he's merely a piece of biomatter without any mind or intention of his own. Pilate was responsible for the sins that he committed against Christ. He scourged an innocent man. He allowed him to be beaten and abused. He will ultimately order him to be crucified. And Pilate is guilty of every one of those acts, and he will answer to God for it. But Jesus says the one who handed him over to Pilate has an even greater sin. And so to whom is Jesus referring in that last statement? Is it, is it Judas, the betrayer? Some commentators think so. Is it Caiaphas, the high priest who orchestrates the plot and lies to the Roman authorities in order to have Jesus killed? It is not God to whom Jesus is referring here because he regards this deliverance as, as sin. And different commentators make cases for different individuals who may be in view. I'm inclined to think that Jesus is referring to Caiaphas. But both Caiaphas and Judas obviously played a very significant role. But in what way is their sin greater than Pilate's sin? After all, Pilate is the one who finally gives the order to put Jesus on the cross. But you have to remember that Judas and Caiaphas are Jews. They're part of the covenant people. They have access to the Hebrew Bible. They have read the prophets. They know the promise that Messiah will come. And they have seen the works of power that Jesus has performed. Works that they themselves have acknowledged are works of the power of God. They know vastly more than Pilate could possibly know. And they have a greater responsibility to recognize and receive the Messiah when he comes. Remember, Judas is given power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. Caiaphas is the high priest whose job it is to welcome the son of David when he comes. And yet, instead, they reject him. They sought to profit from his death. And so while Pilate's sin is great, their sin is is much greater. And so the beginning of verse 12 that we'll explore more fully next week says, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. Pilate realizes, I need to extricate myself from this situation. There are things going on here that I don't understand. This man claims to be a son of the gods. He won't tell me where he's from. He assures me that there's some greater power and purpose behind this all. I don't want to have anything to do with it. But of course, in the end, he will have much to do with it. I want to take the opportunity that this passage gives us to unpack for you for just a moment a doctrine that we've spoken about before, although not always by its proper term, and that is the idea of compatibilism. Now, this is a philosophical term for reconciling what the Bible teaches both about the sovereignty of God and the moral responsibility of man. And it's passages like this and many others in the Bible that that compel us to to wrestle with these two ideas. Is God in control of all that occurs, or is man responsible for the choices that he makes? Of course, the answer to that is yes. 
both are affirmed by the Bible. The Word of God is very clear on this point, especially with regard to the suffering of Jesus. Peter says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23 that he, Christ, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. He's delivered up by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, and yet that is fulfilled by the hands of lawless men. Both are true. Two things can be true at one time. God is sovereign and man is responsible. Later in Acts chapter 4, as the church prays in the upper room in Jerusalem, they say, For truly, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Well, who's involved there? Is it God who determined before that this would be done? Or is it Herod and Pontius Pilate and all of the people of Israel who are collaborating and conspiring to kill Jesus? Both are true. God decreed and foreordained it, but it was carried out through the free choices of responsible human agents. Now this is the sticking point because people will say, but how can their choices be free if what was, what was done had been decided beforehand? Now we could answer that the way that Paul does in Romans chapter 9. You may remember when Paul deals with this kind of objection in Romans 9, he says, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? You're the clay, he's the potter, and you cannot sit in moral judgment of his actions. It's, it's enough simply to say the Bible affirms that God is sovereignly in control of all that there is, and man is responsible for the choices that he makes. We don't have to be able to reconcile those things for those things to be true. I don't know how my car works, but I know that it works, and it got me here this morning. There are all kinds of things in our lives that we may not understand, but nevertheless we see that they are nevertheless true in this way. But I do believe that there is more that we can say about this, because Scripture says more than just that. But before we say anything, we need to be clear that the Bible attributes Jesus' death and many other events in redemptive history, both to God's prior decree and to the actions of men who will be held responsible by God for their sin. Now, as we said, the philosophical term for reconciling these ideas is often, the term that's used often at least, is compatibilism. It's the idea that man freely chooses according to his desires, not contrary to them. And that our desires are determined by our nature. So that we really are making free decisions based upon what we want to do, but that God's decree and will secretly, sovereignly superintends all of those decisions. Now, if an unregenerate man is in bondage to sin, he will continue to choose sin again and again. But he does so freely. It's exactly what he wants. God doesn't coerce him. He chooses it willingly unless and until grace interrupts him and changes his heart and desires. And likewise, a regenerate man, even though he has a sinful nature against which he must wrestle, he has also been given by God a new heart and new desires and that is why Scripture can call that man to work out his own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work within him both to will and to do according to God's good pleasure. So God is working the new desire within us so that we can freely choose according to that desire what God commands us to do, and we can do it by the power of His grace. Many people feel like they must choose between these ideas. They must choose either divine sovereignty or human responsibility. Now, most people will say, oh, we're not choosing between these two. But inevitably, when you look at their answers, when you look at the way that they work out the, the relationship between, they've clearly chosen one over the other. But the Bible affirms both. God is sovereign. Ultimately, exhaustively, meticulously... He does whatever He pleases in heaven and on earth, the psalmist says. He works all things according to the counsel of His will, Paul writes. At the same time, the men who betrayed and arrested and abused and killed Jesus are morally responsible. They chose to do what they did out of envy and greed and malice and indifference. They were not unthinking robots and neither are you and me. They were willing participants in this. Did they make a free choice? Yes. Are they responsible for that choice? Yes. Were those choices part of a larger plan? Of course. 
Of course they were. Everything is. Nothing happens outside of the ultimate purpose, permission, and plan of God. We cannot choose between God's predetermined purpose and man's moral freedom because the Bible teaches both. Freedom for man does not mean doing anything that he can imagine. I am not free to fly by flapping my arms. I'm not free to defy the laws of gravity. I like the illustration that John Shee used in one of our Sunday school classes last year when he said a lion is free to eat what he wants, but he's not going to order a dinner salad. I suppose he could, but he won't. Why? Because he's a lion, and lions don't eat salad. We choose according to our desires, and our desires are determined by our nature. That does not mean we are not free in those choices. It simply means that the options before us are inevitably limited by who and what we are. We choose to do what we want. God does not force us, and we willingly participate as secondary agents in accomplishing just what He decreed long before. He is sovereign. And we are responsible. Now, I suspect that is familiar to all, if not uh, most of you, if not all of you. But let me now make an application of that idea that comes directly from our text. Because here is Jesus beaten, scourged, abused, mocked, about to be killed. And he says all of it is ultimately under the sovereign hand of God. He says, my father brought me here. Not Judas, not Caiaphas. Pilate, you don't have any power except that which has already been given to you from above. It is my Father who sent me here. How do we deal with providentially appointed injustice? Because that's what this is. Jesus' betrayal and arrest, his torture and execution was the greatest injustice ever committed in the history of the world. And, at the same time, it was the most perfect act of justice that ever had been. It's an act of divine justice. Because God is making atonement for the sins of his people. And yet he's doing so through great injustice in human courts. Did Jesus enjoy that experience? We know He didn't. We see Him in the Garden of Gethsemane pleading with His Father, let this cup pass from Me. But in the end, He willingly accepted that this was necessary to accomplish our redemption and thank Christ that He did. But that experience for Jesus as the God-man was brutal on many levels, more than we can properly account for. We we do not suffer like Christ because Christ is so much more than we are. He's everything that we are, but He's more than we are. And there was not only physical and emotional and mental anguish that He endured, there was a spiritual level of suffering that we cannot quantify or possibly understand. And yet he endured it all because that injustice was appointed by his father and therefore he was content to rest under that decree. How do we handle injustice that is committed against us? I want to be very careful here because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm going to say. I am not suggesting that injustice should be tolerated. I'm not suggesting that it is wrong to protest or, or seek redress of grievances through proper authorities. I'm not saying we must simply suffer in silence. And I'm most definitely not saying we should be silent when someone else is being mistreated or suffering wrong. But every one of us knows that there will be times when we are mistreated, when men are unjust and abusive and slanderous and hateful, and there may be very little that we can do about it. That there are no options to seek justice, or that all of those options have been exhausted. Even if there is a remedy for that suffering, how do we handle the pain that that experience will cause for the rest of our lives? And I want to suggest to you this morning that the way we do so is we learn to say with Jesus, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. We learn to say with Job, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We learn to sing with Paul, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
we learn to rest in the fact that God sovereignly appoints every experience, whether pleasant or painful. We rest in His sovereign purpose. We know that He will not allow anything to happen in our lives, that He will not also work together for our good. That He will use every circumstance to draw us closer to Himself and to make us more like His Son. We're reminded that He will never leave us nor forsake us, even in those times when it may seem like He has. And when it feels to us as if He is no longer there, we trust His Word. We trust His promise. We know that He is concealed in the shadows and that evil will not touch us any farther than His good purpose allows. There is strong comfort in seeing how Christ endures suffering. And there is practical advantage to learning from that example. And that's exactly how Peter applies it in 1 Peter chapter 2. Christ suffered for you, therefore arm yourself, prepare yourself to suffer with Him. Jesus endured torture and abuse, ridicule and injustice, and even death itself because He knew the divine purpose, plan, and power that lay behind and governed it all. He was confident in His Father's decree. He understood what His duty required. And He was empowered by the Spirit who remained upon Him. He suffered it all for our sakes. Not merely that we might have a moral example and so might be encouraged or inspired to endure when we suffer. No, He did it so that our sins might be forgiven, that our souls might be delivered from destruction, and that our hearts might be at rest knowing that Christ our Savior has come. He stood in our place and did what none of us ever could. And because He did, we live today. And we are enabled to live with greater peace and stronger hope and a clearer purpose. Because we know that the same decree that sent Jesus to the cross will guide us through life and into glory. And that no circumstances or evil can ever come to pass that will cause that purpose to fail. Let's bow together. Our God and Father, this is a hard truth for us to wrap our minds around. Oh Lord, we love the gospel that we hear and that we receive because of the suffering of Christ. But the idea that you called him to suffer injustice at the hands of men and that you will call your people to the same in the present age is a hard word. But Lord, there is strong comfort here. Strong comfort to know that your hand guides it all. Comfort to know that your purpose will not allow the the plots of the devil and of wicked men to proceed any further than good would appoint. Oh God, we pray that you would help us to learn contentment in your hand. Contentment under your purpose. To learn contentment even when we suffer injustice, oh Lord, trusting that you will make all things new. And that one day, O Lord, you will bring righteousness and justice to bear in this world and in every circumstance of our lives. We pray, O God, that you would strengthen us and bless us, that this word might be our comfort and encouragement this day. In Jesus' holy name, amen.